20 p.m. December 31st, 2019. Hopefully this is nothing out of the ordinary, but an at ProMed mail posting about unexplained pneumonias in China is giving me hashtag SARS flashbacks. Boston, USA. In the last few hours of 2019, Helen Branswell, senior infectious disease reporter for Stat News, started tweeting about the reports coming out of Wuhan. It was something I definitely thought we needed to be watching. This was something that was setting off alarm bells. 12.31 a.m., January 15th, 2020. Here's where we are on the SARS-like virus found in China. Still many, many questions. Two weeks later, in Berlin, Kai Kupferschmidt, a molecular biomedicine expert and correspondent for Science magazine, joined the discussion about the still undefined virus. It was really becoming clear that the pandemic was just not going to be stopped. It was clear to everyone what was about to happen. 11.35 a.m. January 29, 2020. Modi government's science denialism will get us all killed long before fascism gets a chance. Hashtag coronavirus pandemic. By the end of January, health and science journalist Vidya Krishnan was trying to get the word out in India, despite facing significant political challenges. Because the entire political machinery was only focused on uh, the Hindu-Muslim riots in the country, no one paid attention to this pandemic which was inching closer every day. Three science journalists from three different countries, all sounding the alarm on the virus that would come to be known as COVID-19 well before the rest of the world realized what was coming. Their readership and online followings have skyrocketed as they've taught you terms like flattening the curve. They've schooled you on the importance of lockdowns and mass testing. They've documented the failings of governments to act when the data was there for all to see. And they know how to deal with scientists. In early February, Helen Branswell challenged Dr. Anthony Fauci who many consider to be the voice of reason on the Trump administration's coronavirus task force. At present, given everything that's going on, the risk is really relatively low. Explain to me why the risk is low, somebody, because to me, when I look at this, this virus spreading, it's spreading very e efficiently. And I can't see why, like, there's no force field around China. Right. It's not going to stop there. Again, it, Helen, yeah. you seem pretty frustrated in that forum. Why was that? You know, I had been hearing for several weeks authorities in the U.S. and other countries outside of China saying that they thought that the risk outside of China was low. And it made zero sense to me because the virus was spreading really effectively from person to person in China. So when Dr. Fauci said that he thought the risk was quite low for the United States at that point, I pushed back because it made no sense. He did say, you know, could this become a pandemic? Absolutely. But it felt like they didn't want to alarm people. At that point, it wasn't coming. It was already, you know, spreading in the United States. It just hadn't been recognized. Kai, your work has also proven to be prescient. An article you wrote back in 2013 included a quote about a bat in China carrying a potential pandemic. This was Peter Daszak, a, a researcher that I had talked to, that quote comes from him. So I was just doing my job as a reporter, reporting his views. So, you know, if anything, he predicted it. Again and again in the, in the last 10 years or so, when I was doing my reporting, this, this sentence came up from scientists where they were telling me, you know, it's not a question of if there will be uh, a big pandemic, the question is when. Scientists like Peter Daszak are crucial for reporters like Kupferschmidt, because like most areas of reporting, science journalism starts with the sources. And there are two sources that many science journalists have in common. The first is called ProMed. It's the place where both Branswell and Kupferschmidt first heard about an outbreak in Wuhan. It's an online portal where infectious disease experts share and discuss information on unusual health events. It's not designed for journalists, but has become invaluable for many health reporters who have the background to understand the significance of what's on there. 
The second source these journalists have in common is what they call pre-print servers. They're a kind of testing ground for academics, a place where they share their research online before it gets peer-reviewed and published. In normal times, a lot of scientists hold that research back, play it safe until they're sure of their work. But COVID-19 has changed things. Scientists are flooding the servers with information they hope will help curb the virus, maybe even cure it. And some of that material is making it into the headlines. When that happens, and potentially invaluable but often unverified information reaches the public, it can easily end up being misconstrued by both the press and politicians. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're going to test that too. Sounds interesting. One of the things that I found tragic about uh, this pandemic and the coverage of the pandemic is how politicized the whole thing has become. Which side of the divide people fall on relates to which party they support. There's a deep misunderstanding of what's going on in certain parts of the country. We have a right-wing anti-science government which has been pushing out traditional remedies and it has been asking uh, our population to rely on Ayurveda or homeopathy or yoga or Greek medicine to boost your immunity. Apni immunity badhane ke liye Ayush Mantrale dwara jo nirdesh diye gaye hain उसका अगर हम पालन करें गर्म पानी है काढ़ा है इनका निरंतर सेवन करें दे वांट द रिपोर्टिंग टू बी इन लाइन विद द पॉलिटिक्स सो दैट इट डजंट मेक इंडिया लुक बैड द मिनट द स्टोरी गोस ऑनलाइन वी हैव गवर्नमेंट हैंडल्स एंड पॉलिटिशियंस अटैकिंग इंडिविजुअल रिपोर्टर्स एंड क्वेश्चनिंग आवर इंटीग्रिटी एंड डिसमिसिंग द स्टोरी without actually pointing out what's wrong factually that's been put out one of the reasons the politics tends to trump the science is because that's the way the politicians want it reflected in the officials they make available at their briefings where scientific experts are usually outnumbered by politicos reflected also in the press corps covering them a shortage of reporters trained in the science of the story. I'm not sure that science journalists need to take the lead, but I certainly think they should be, you know, at the table. And I think that is something that also bothers me when I see the press conferences. There are a lot of important questions that science journalists know to ask, that political journalists don't know to ask. Do you have a message for people in Georgia who are soon going to have a choice about going to the hair salon or the nail salon or getting that tattoo? Retail businesses need a bit of time, shops need a bit of time to prepare to open. Are they opening on June the 1st? Mich würde interessieren, für welchen Zeithorizont diese Planungen gelten. Hat das Auswirkungen auf politische Gipfel bei der EU-Ratspräsidentschaft oder aber in Bayern auf die Wiesen? It just seems like these press conferences would really profit if there were also science journalists there. We are reporting with our hands tied behind our back. We don't have access to information. And our scientists do not, are not free to express their opinions. We have a daily media briefing, which uh, at this point does not have a single scientist briefing us and does not have a single science journalist in the audience. We have bureaucrats and uh, bureaucrats uh, don't know what they're talking about. And the political journalists don't know uh, they are asking the wrong questions. Another way to put it, rather than dispatching medical specialists to diagnose the biggest story of our time, to surgically dissect political narratives on COVID-19, most news organisations are sending in the equivalent of family doctors, the general practitioners of journalism. That's hardly the best use of available resources when the story you're covering is a pandemic.